Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! So, several years ago, my friend, we will call him Boris, and I would always help each other do the spring cleanup for our properties. This included taking out damaged trees, preparing garden plots, and taking care of our weed-infested yards. I was going to be first on the cleanup details, so I prepared tools and implements the Friday before the big cleanup was to happen. Sharpening tools and chainsaw chains, lawn more play than just getting everything in order. Among those tasks was mixing hard with two cycle oil. Finished up kind of late and generally put things away for the next day. The next morning, Boris shows up with a coffee and biscuits around 8 am. As we were sitting on his tailgate enjoying breakfast, my neighbors rode by and their beat the hell Chevy Cavalier smoking like a freight train. We will call them Rocky and Bullwinkle. Boris and I made the usual jokes about the amount of smoke pouring from the exhaust. Damn. But they go to the gas station and fill up with oil and check the gas. We soon finished breakfast and thought no more about it. As we begin to get the tools laid out and have a plan of attack, I cannot find my gas cans. No mixed gas, regular gas, or a gas can in general. And that's when it dawned on me why the car Rocky and Bullwinkle were driving was smoking so bad. I am best to say the least. Well, all Boris and I could do was go shopping for gas cans, gas, and more to cycle oil. After we returned, we saw Rocky and Bullwinkle pass by several times. But all in all, we got a lot done. The next weekend, we dedicated ourselves to cleaning up at Boris's. A weekend or two goes by and we have a family dinner at my wife's, Rocky and Bullwinkle's grandparents. Toward the later part of the evening, we were having a few drinks. Most people had left and myself and my wife's grandfather were shooting the breeze when I had to take a leak. As I was doing so, I saw a gas can with very distinct paint on it. I inquired from the old man about how it came into his position and he stated that Rocky and Bullwinkle left it there. I simply explained it was mine, as was another, and loaded them in my truck. It ate at me every time that car was my post neighbors went by. So I hatched a plan from a rotten egg. I went and bought a few gallons of gas, a few gallons of diesel fuel, and some other various oils. I made a concoction of these different chemicals and filled my new 6-gallon gas can I had to purchase. With some clean gas, I filled a lawn mower and cut some grass that evening, making sure Rocky and Bullwinkle saw me. Then I put everything away but forgot and left that rotten egg gas can out. I got up and went to work the next morning and didn't even think to check on the can, but when I got home, I checked and it was gone. My wife informed me that my plan must have worked as she watched Rocky and Paul Winkle go in and out with a car not only smoking, but spitting and sputtering as well. The last time they rode out, they didn't try back in. Hmm. They gave me about an hour of peace before they came over and wanted to know if I could look at the car and see what was wrong. If it could not be fixed on the side of the road, maybe tow it home. My response? I've had a long day and have a migraine. Maybe tomorrow. I saw the panic set in when I told them that. And that's when they told me they had no insurance and it was on a main road. Tough luck. So the highway patrol did run across it and had it towed. It was going to cost them around $500 to get it out of impound Plus, they had to have current registration and insurance. The car wasn't worth it. Well, there are those types of people that good luck just falls on them, and the pastor of a local church gave them an old Taurus. Took me a few cans of rotten egg gas, but I got the motor to lock up after about a month. This time, it quit in their grandparents' yard. So, they scrapped it, and as luck would have it, they got their income tax returns. They bought a nice-looking Ford F-150, but it began having problems too. Smoked really bad. They did take it to a mechanic that eventually found the problem. He got the truck running right again for about $1,500. And I have never had any more gas come up missing. My crazy story begins with me lying in a hospital bed, feeling like a human pinata after a gnarly accident. 
when a wild Karen enters the scene. Let me take you through the roller coaster of events that unfolded before my eyes. But before we delve into the chaos, let's get to know me a bit better. I'm Alex, a regular guy who loves living life to the fullest. Whether I'm exploring the great outdoors or trying out the latest food trends, I'm always up for an adventure. Unfortunately, this particular adventure landed me in the hospital. And that's where our story begins. Okay, let's dive right into the action. There I was, lying in my hospital bed connected to various peeping machines and wearing an oxygen mask. I'll spare you the gory details, but let's just say my body had seen better days. The room was quiet except for the occasional sound of footsteps echoing through the hallway. Suddenly, the door burst open and in walked Karen, the mad dog. You know the type, hair that could rival a bird's nest? She stormed towards my bed, her eyes locked on me like a predator stalking its prey. Excuse me, what are you doing in my bed? Get out! She shrieked. I blinked in disbelief, unsure of how to respond. I managed to stammer. I'm sorry, but this is my bed. The doctor assigned it to me because, well, I'm in pretty bad shape. Karen scoffed as if my injuries were a mere inconvenience to her grand plans. I don't care about your injuries. I demand to be treated first. I have things to do and places to be. I couldn't believe the audacity of this woman. I mustered up the courage to defend myself, even in my weakened state. Look, I understand you're in a hurry, but the doctor has prioritized my treatment because I'm in critical condition. Apparently, reason wasn't in Karen's vocabulary. In one swift motion, she reached over and snatched my oxygen mask off my face, leaving me gasping for air. It felt like I had been punched in the gut by a heavyweight boxer. Hey, what are you doing? That's essential for me right now. I struggled to breathe without the mask. Karen gave me a wicked grin as if she relished my suffering. You don't need it as much as I do. Now get out of my way. I watched as Karen began to push me off the bed. Determined to take my place, panic set in as I realized that my injuries made it difficult for me to defend myself. But just as I was about to hit the floor, a voice of reason cut through the chaos. Excuse me, what on earth do you think you're doing? It was Dr. Johnson, my savior in this banana world I'm living in. Karen froze, not believing that someone would dare to question her actions. I demand to be treated first. It is my turn and this man can wait. The doctor stepped forward. Ma'am, this man is in critical condition and requires immediate attention. Your case is not as urgent. I suggest you wait your turn like everyone else. At this point, Karen was practically about to burst from anger. And yeah, surely the story doesn't end there. The hospital staff, alerted by the commotion, rushed to my aid. They helped me back onto the bed and swiftly called security to handle the situation. As Karen continued to argue and protest her treatment, the security guards arrived and tried to handcuff her. You are under arrest for assaulting a patient and causing a disturbance. One of the guards announced. The look on Karen's face was priceless, but boy, she wasn't going to go down without a fight. As the security guards approached Karen, her eyes widened, and she planted her feet firmly on the ground, refusing to budge an inch. It was as if she believed she could single-handedly take on the entire hospital staff. I will not be treated like a criminal. I demand to speak to your supervisor, she yelled. The guards exchanged glances unfazed by Karen's desperate plea. Apparently, they had dealt with their fair share of entitled individuals and were prepared for the show that was about to unfold. With a gentle yet assertive touch, they reached out to handcuff her, expecting her to comply. But Karen simply transformed into a raging whirlwind of chaos, flailing her arms and kicking her legs in a desperate attempt to free herself from their grasp. She knocked over chairs, sending them clattering to the floor, and grabbed onto anything within reach, creating a mess wherever she went. The hospital staff, stunned by the madness they are witnessing, stepped back giving the guard some space to handle the situation. Nurses hurriedly gathered patients and bystanders out of harm's way. Man, please cooperate. We're just doing our job. One of the guards pleaded, trying to reason with her. But reason was a foreign concept to her at this point. With a guttural roar, Karen swiped at the guard, narrowly missing his face. 
It was clear that she was determined to make her exit as dramatic as possible. Consequences be damned. Realizing that reasoning was Karen was futile, the guards swiftly adjusted their tactics. They called for backup and soon, more security personnel arrived on the scene. Together, they formed a human barrier around Karen, ensuring she couldn't harm herself or anyone else. As the chaos escalated, the guards employed a combination of verbal commands and physical restraint techniques to subdue Karen without causing her any harm. And finally, after what seemed like an eternity, Karen's struggles subsided. She slumped in defeat, and the guards wasted no time in securely handcuffing her, ensuring that she couldn't cause any further chaos. With Karen finally under control, the security personnel began the arduous task of escorting her out of the hospital. I heard them as they made their way through the hospital corridors, and Karen continuing to make a scene, shouting expletives and hurling insults at anyone with an earshot. I was later told that after the security team reached the hospital's main entrance, a police car was just arriving to take Karen into custody. With Karen safely secured inside the vehicle, the doors closed and the police car slowly disappeared into the distance, the hospital returned to its usual state of peace. A few days after my release from the hospital, as I was finally beginning to regain my strength, I received an unexpected call. It was from the local police department. He explained that they had received reports of the altercation with Karen and wanted to follow up on the matter. The officer expressed concern for my well-being and asked if I would be willing to press charges against Karen for assault. While I wasn't one to harbor resentment or seek revenge, I realized that taking legal action was necessary. So I took a deep breath and replied, Officer, thank you for reaching out, I appreciate your concern, and yes, I would like to press charges against Karen for assault. The officer understood my stance and assured me that they would proceed with the necessary legal steps. He explained that they would gather statements from witnesses, review security camera footage, and build a strong case against Karen. The evidence against her was substantial, bolstered by witness testimonies and the hospital security footage. In the end, Karen was found guilty of multiple charges and sentenced accordingly. The judge taking into account the evidence presented, the testimonies of witnesses and consequences of Karen's actions, ruled that she would serve a sentence of six months in jail and additionally, she was ordered to attend mandatory anger management classes. As for me, well, I've made a full recovery and returned to my adventurous lifestyle. I've even added a new item to my survival kit, a special Karen repellent. Just kidding. But hey, you never know when you might encounter one of these entitled creatures in the wild, right? During my last year in college, I got hired onto the production crew of a small manufacturing company. The production team leader, purely by virtue of seniority, was a guy I'll code named Dirk. Present physique 6'4", when standing upright, face a 2, regularly physically intimidated other folks in a building for sport, told stories with strong intentional bigot vibes. High school dropout, chain wallet, different monster energy drink hat for each day of the week. Dirk's favorite joke was calling me a schoolboy because I was going to college, get it? Followed by assertions that education is a scam and smart people are actually dumb. And only pick your pejorative, go to college and so on. The other eight employees in the building really wanted Dirk gone. The owner slash boss slash inventor of the proprietary manufacturing process was a brilliant mechanical engineer. But terrible with people and very susceptible to Dirk's intimidation techniques. So Dirk stayed. Anyhow, within the first months, Dirk decided it was my job to take material and product inventory every two weeks. Whatever. He's a middle manager, he can delegate. Usually a three-person job, I was of course made to do it alone. Usually kept me at work well after midnight. But at least I was getting paid over time. And the building was empty and quiet. After six months on a production team, I graduated from college and got promoted out of the warehouse and into the product design office. A great gig, the one I wanted from the beginning. Near the end of my third day in the office, Dirk poked his head in the door and asserted that I was still expected to take inventory that night. I reminded him that I don't work in the warehouse anymore. And he reminded me that he's a dangerous person 
by man dogging into my personal space bubble and cursing a lot. And I capitulated. Believe him, perhaps erroneously, that my new office co-workers would have my back if Dirk went berserk. I decided to take inventory in Roman numerals, which Dirk couldn't read. Really show him what a guy who is basic 11th grade literacy is capable of. I wasn't present for the incident, but when I arrived at work the next morning, the warehouse was trashed. Dirk had seen the inventory clipboard gone ballistic and started pulling everything off the shelves. The police were called, as I understood it, Dirk lived peacefully with the cops and wasn't arrested, but was immediately fired and legally barred from approaching the building or any of its employees. After Dirk's departure, we promoted a new production lead. The machines ran faster and more efficiently. All the product came out cleaner. And all of the supply problems we were having with raw materials were actually just Dirk being equal parts lazy and stupid. I have an older brother. and We have a great relationship. He's married, but I never felt comfortable around his pals. But since it's not my business, I never said anything, especially since my brother seemed happy with his choice. Two weeks ago was my niece's fifth anniversary. They decided to throw a big party and I was invited. I asked my brother what to bring to his kids since I'm not good at all of these things, but he said that any toy should do. A few days after this conversation, his wife called me and said that her kid needed an iPad and that it would be great if her uncle would bring her one. It amazed me. So I called my brother and asked him again, but he said the same thing. Bring some toy and forget about it. I consulted with my friend who has two kids and she told me that a mud kitchen for kids would be great for this age, arguing that it's an excellent way to teach a kid new skills. So I simply ordered one and wrapped it festively. When opening the gifts, mine was the last. My niece had a tantrum when she saw it was not a tablet. She started screaming at her mom, you said that uncle would give me a tablet. You promised me. It was an ugly scene and they barely calmed her down. Everyone stared at me and I felt very uncomfortable. While my brother was saying goodbye to the guests, his wife approached me and started scolding me for letting them all down and making me look bad. She apparently expected that I would apologize and since I didn't, she got outraged. She started yelling that since I won't learn to respect her, I won't buy the iPad, I am not a wanted guest in their house. I simply left. And the weirdest thing is that my brother doesn't answer my calls since then. To be honest, I don't know what to think. Is this my fault? And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.